All right, start it over, Don. Okay, Thank this you. is a presentation for the incoming Fellows to Anderson Clinic. And I'd like to start out first by welcoming you guys and then asking you a question. How long do you know, think that Anderson Clinic has been in existence? Take a guess. 60 years. That's a very good guess. You're a little bit too short because it's actually been 76 years. Anderson Clinic was founded in 1940, and it was founded by my father, Otto Anderson Eng, who, if I ask you one other question, how long do you think this specialty of orthopedic surgery has been in existence? I don't even, I don't even have a guess for that. Well, it's actually uh, 82 years, so. Oh, wow. So Anderson Clinic is almost as old as the, as the specialty of orthopedic surgery. Well, my father finished his residency in, in uh, medical school. He medical, medical school went to Temple University in Philadelphia, and then he did a residency in orthopedics at what was called Gallagher Hospital in Pennsylvania. And mostly his training, of course, at that time, most... Most what orthopedists did was mostly children's orthopedics. It was mostly congenital problems, and uh, and there was some open fracture management, but not closed fracture. So my father finished his training in 1938, and when he he moved to Washington D.C. and went into practice with the only orthopedist in Washington D.C. One orthopedist. His name was. Custis Lee Hall, and my father went to work for Custis Lee. He was paid $200 a month, and he worked for Custis Lee for two years, and then decided that he thought he could start his own practice, so he left Custis Lee and opened his practice in a little house in Arlington, Virginia. And at that time, of course, he had, he had no practice. It was two months before he saw his first patient in practice, so he was li really living, living off my mother. My mother was a school teacher, but nobody, at that time, nobody knew that mother and dad were married. They thought they were just living in sin, living together. Uh, the reason for that was that school teachers in 1938 could not be married. They were only single women that could be school teachers. Really? Yes, it was felt that, that married women should be home taking care of children, not teaching school. So my mother and father were secretly married, and my father was living off of my mother's income as a school teacher. Well, after my father got his practice started, now remember, orthopedists had very limited practice at that time. Most everything was done by family doctors, general practitioners, and there were some surgeons, but surgeons operated on everything, you know, not just orthopedics, you know, until these subspecialists came along. So. My father's practice, as I said, was mostly children's orthopedics. He did also do open fracture management, mostly broken hips. Um, he told me the story once that on one weekend he did, he, he put pins in 10 hips, broke, and I'm sorry, 12 broken hips in 12 different hospitals. He was a, had privileges at every hospital in the metropolitan Washington area. But he didn't have a whole lot of, of emergency room work to do other than things like open fracture treatment because um, the fractures were managed, as I mentioned, by family practitioners mostly. Uh, he did a lot of children's orthopedics and early on he realized that there was a real need in the community because the biggest problem for children was polio I mean, it was really an epidemic at that time. And, and one of the problems was that the hospital didn't have beds specifically for kids with polio. And one of the common complications of polio was paralysis of the respiratory muscles. So these kids couldn't breathe and to keep them alive, you had to put them in a machine called an iron lung. And it was a big round machine that you'd put them in and use negative pressure, which would expand their lungs. It would physically open their lungs up and, and let them breathe without any tubes in their throat. And uh, 
So my father realized there was a need for a hospital for these children because there was no place for them. And, and so he went to the community and he solicited help from the community. They raised money, but mostly what they did was they got everything donated, all the bricks and mortar, wood, everything was donated by the community and the local unions on the weekends worked and built this hospital, which was called Anderson Hospital. And it was just for treatment of kids with polio. There were 16 beds in the hospital and it was attached to my father's office. My father donat donated the land for the hospital. And uh, it was 16 beds, but the hospital had, had no cafeteria, it had no laundry. It was just 16 beds, that was it, one ward. This is pertinent because my mother, I think, formed probably, if not the first one, the very first women's auxiliaries in the, in the, related to a hospital in the country. And every night, the ladies of the women's auxiliary would take all the dirty bed sheets, towels, and everything, dirty clothes, they'd take them home and wash them. And not only would they, and they had to do this all by hand, they had to wash everything by hand. There were no washing machines then. And then they bring bring them back and make the beds fresh every morning and take the dirty linens home. The other thing they did was there was no cafeteria, so they had to fix the meals for all the children in the hospital at home, and they would bring those in each day for, for the children. So the women were every bit as important as the doctors in the care of these children. So the Anderson Hospital was community built. It, was filled all the time with these children. And this was right near the end of the Second World War. The other thing that, that uh, my father treated a lot was bone infection. Remember, this was prior to the, to the development of, of penicillin. There were no antibiotics. There was no penicillin, nothing. If you got an infection in your bone, the only way you treated it was what was called saucerization. You would remove all the tissue that went right down to the bone, the skin, everything right to the bone and so that the pus could drain out. But she couldn't put the patient on antibiotics. That was an operation called saucerization to really open everything up and drain it out. Well, the good news was in the early 50s, as you all know, the soft vaccine was developed and polio was essentially eradicated almost not 100%, but 98% was eradicated. So now all of a sudden this 16 bed hospital full of children, mostly in iron lungs, had no function or purpose. And so they, my father had to do something. So what he did was they had to change the profile of the hospital. They went to the federal government and they got a grant to convert it, to expand it, to enlarge it. They, it first enlarged to 40 beds and subsequently to 80 beds through government money. And, they, and they, the, uh, the, uh, the role of the hospital now was to treat injured federal employees. Of course, Washington, D.C. had many federal working people. And so the hospital was converted from a children's hospital to an adult hospital for federal employees. And they continue this way. Why this is pertinent is, is my father developed a close relationship with the federal government. And every week he would do two things. He would go to a crippled children's clinic in Arlington, and he would go to, um, I'm sorry, he would go to a, um, to a clinic over in D.C., a public health clinic, which, where he would see these injured government employees and uh, if they needed to be admitted or have something done, they had to be admitted to the hospital, which now no longer was called Anderson Hospital. It, they changed the name to National Orthopedic Hospital. So did they just stop taking care of kids with polio, or did they do that along with federal employees? No, they still took care of children with polio, but, the, but there were very few of them now. It wasn't an epidemic anymore. Oh, okay. Um, well, my, my brother, who was born the, the year my father started practice, which was 1938, 
finished his residency at Johns Hopkins in 1969, and he then went to work in the U.S. Public Health Hospital in Baltimore for two years, and then he joined my father in practice. My brother was very interested in doing joint replacement surgery, which was not allowed in the United States when he first came out into practice. But my brother had done a, a few of these cases at Johns Hopkins in his residency. And, um, but the federal government had not approved the operation, so my brother had to go to the federal government and request uh, what was called an, an ID, a, uh, an FDA number to do hip replacements. And there were very few of these numbers given out in the United States, but my brother got one of them, so he was the only doctor in metropolitan Washington, Northern Virginia, Maryland, that was licensed to do hip replacement in the early 70s. And this was very pertinent for him because he got in on the ground floor with hip replacement surgery. I was two years behind my brother, and I came out of my training at Yale in 1973 after doing two years in the Army. And I was stationed at Fort Belvoir, but then moved, moved in practice with my brother and father and two other doctors in 1973. I was very interested in a procedure that was brand new at the time called arthroscopy. And there was one doctor in Washington, D.C. that had done some, a few cases of arthros uh, arthroscopy. And I went over and actually observed him doing surgery. And he was using a uh, a, a tube, actually at that time, arthroscopy, you look through a hollow tube that had a light bulb in the end and had some lenses. So you literally look through this tube, you didn't do any surgery through it. It was strictly a diagnostic procedure. And I thought this had promise, but so I went to my hospital and requested that they buy an arthroscope so I could do this type of surgery. Unfortunately, the hospital would not buy the arthroscope because the medical staff felt it was of no value, so I had to buy my own arthroscope. But after a year of doing my own arthroscopy, the hospital changed its mind and decided to buy an arthroscope. And everybody else could then start doing it, but I got a head start. So now over the next 10 years of the 70s, my brother was refining his skills with hip replacement. I was doing mostly sports mess, and I was doing a lot of arthroscopy. And as you know, it evolved into arthroscopic surgery, and I learned early on how to do that. And was taking care of a lot of sports injuries, a lot of high school athletes. I was also doing a lot of scoliosis work because scoliosis screening was something I was doing in the high schools along with evaluating injured athletes. Um, well, fortunately, or I should say unfortunately, by the late 70s, my brother Charlie came to realize that the biggest problem with hip replacement, the way they failed, was that the implant would come loose. And it was felt around the world that the problem at the time that caused the loosening was a reaction to the bone cement. The way the implants, of course, were put in at that time was to bond the implant to the bone with a with a with a, a, a bone a bone cement was used for the bonding and it was felt that either the bone reacted to the cement or something happened that then caused the implants to come loose and once they came loose they were very hard to fix again and my brother became interested in in a new way of potentially attaching implants to bone which was to use a, a metal implant that was porous in nature so that the bone could actually grow into the metal. And there was a little company in Canada by the name of MetaShield that had a, a proprietary patent on this process of making an implant that was porous so that the bone could actually grow to the implant. Unfortunately, MetaShield was a very small company and it, it in only a year or two went bankrupt. My brother had put in some of their implants and he thought it had promise so. Well, when the company went bankrupt, the patent was bought by a, a then fairly large